Thank you very much for the committee, organized committee, and uh, also uh, Eli to uh, provide me this opportunity to give, uh, invite a talk here. And I think that uh, one of the important uh, discoveries in this century is obviously is uh, surface emitting laser and uh, uh, majorly uh, used in a high speed optical interconnect. So that's satisfy the physical change of the world today. Uh, so uh, my outline will talk, gonna talk a little bit about the history of semiconductor laser. Uh, 1962 was invented and surface emitting laser was 79, several years later. And the discovery of native oxide uh, in 1990 to 94 changed the, the, the device uh, threshold uh, current. And then uh, we talk about the impact commercialization of the device, provide energy efficient uh, data rate transmission for optical link and 3D imaging. And what's the future for is basically the device have some certain uh, bandwidth limitation and uh, we're looking forward to see the new device and new physics on this talk. So the, the demanding, obviously, uh, this morning, uh, there's a lot of talk about the uh, data uh, transfer. So obviously, there's two major uh, important applications going on. One is the data center. Uh, major the data center was uh, require a lot of data. And you can see as uh, time grows, this uh, exponential increase of the data requirement definitely uh, forcing a lot of data transfer required to do. Uh, number two is the high, high, uh, high performance computing, and that require uh, a lot of uh, uh, high speed uh, chip uh, to do that work also. And uh, eventually, uh, the electrical connection is getting uh, uh, so much attenuation because of uh, a lot of uh, microwave loss in the distance. So results of that are shifting uh, the connection from the electrical interconnect into optical interconnect. And that results into a today's uh, the VIXO and the DFE laser are the major component for the optical emitter. So uh, uh, the, the direct bank gap material is basically starting in the bank gap engineering law in the LED. That's uh, change of energy bank gap allow you to see uh, the light from uh, infrared to visible. And the most important part come out of that physics is the electron hole recombination in direct bank of semiconductor uh, do produce light instead of just a heat on that. And the first semiconductor laser was uh, happening at GE uh, by iron hole uh, for gallium arsenide and PN junction and uh, commercialized in 1963, uh, immediately a year later for the LED portion of that. Uh, first, uh, alloy semiconductor laser also happened uh, two, three months later by Nick Honiak Jr. in 1962 and commercial into LED in uh, 63 also. So this semiconductor technology is uh, quite important in terms of uh, not only for the invention of the transistor by Bardeen, but also uh, later by uh, alloy semiconductor into the uh, modern uh, photonic device. So uh, some more history here, and obviously uh, 62 is a major breakthrough for semiconductor laser and LED, and that's beginning to uh, see the visibility in our LED device. Commercialization very quickly, a year later, is expensive, but uh, the first product we see used was on the HP, comp uh, cell, uh, HP calculator, and I remember it was $400 a piece calculator. Now it's about two bucks, I think. And the uh, uh, second major break uh, was uh, the 69 Herbert Cromer's HPT, and today every cell phone is using HPT for the power amplifier. And uh, then we see a, a major break uh, in the current injection quantum wire laser, 1977 demonstrated. And the uh, 79 uh, surface emitting laser was uh, first uh, discovered by IGA and uh, later uh, demonstrate the CW operation 89. Uh, for subsequently, a lot of development going on uh, for integrated DBR quantum well uh, demonstrated in 89 uh, by Jack Jew. And then oxide confined was then discovered to lower the threshold. And that's the most important part we're going to discuss today uh, in at the Illinois. And therefore, oxide confined VIXO was uh, realized in 1994. And the first commercial product was 2002 by HP uh, for optical link. 
Uh, so the first vertical cavity uh, laser was uh, proposed and done, demonstrated by uh, Iga, and uh, this is a cavity lens, and it's quite long, it's actually 90 micron, and uh, it's using a metal cavity, and uh, so it demonstrates the surface emission, it's a liquid nitrogen pulse, and uh, obviously a major problem is uh, using a, met medical, uh, a metal uh, cavity and that results into a considerable amount of optical loss. So if you're gonna use a metal cavity for nano, nano uh, photonics, obviously you're gonna suffer considerable uh, optical loss in the past. Uh, at that time, uh, threshold current is about 900 milliamp, and I want you to remember this number, and 900 milliamp is a lot of current for today's uh, laser, but at that time, that was the first discovery, so therefore it's a fantastic uh, piece of work we see. Uh, then uh, subsequently uh, develop uh, uh, using a DVR, which is a dielectric DVR, uh, which is SiO2 and TiO2 on the, on the top, on the bottom of this uh, laser structure here, and the top here using a DVR plus gold metal, <laughs> again, on the other side. So the threshold at that time still high. It's uh, 36 milliamp. But change from 900 milliamp to 36 milliamp is a fantastic development. And it takes 10 years uh, to do that. It's not like uh, you, you got a good idea, you can work. It takes a lot of uh, other people's idea to put together and integrate together and results into the first uh, uh, room temperature operation, uh, 25 degrees C. But uh, threshold, they have 36 milliamp, and that current is much higher than DBR laser today. Therefore, uh, application is still limited. Nobody can use it, right? So uh, here's come from a, a discovery, and I'd like to uh, share with you a little bit of story here because I work with uh, Nick Hornick Jr. And the story was uh, the Healer Pack LED division tried to develop hybrid LED with high content aluminum uh, gallium arsenide. And uh, reliability was a big problem because you sit there, the guy oxidizes, it, and uh, nobody can use that device. So for industry, uh, reliability was a big problem. So they co up uh, George Crawford was a CTO at that time. Co op uh, Nick Honiak said, Well, do you have any solution? And uh, they sent a couple of samples to them. And uh, so Nick said, Well, you know, you hire a graduate student, so I'll start working on that problem. The graduate then saw the problem, say, Well, this oxidation process is going to take me 10 years to see the results. Am I going to stay here for 10 years? And uh, that was a pretty interesting starting point, right? <laughs> No, the point is that the professor obviously pretty smart. He said, well, why don't you put more water vapor and heat up the tube and to a higher temperature? And well, that idea changed the world, actually, <laughs> right? And uh, that changed the whole cycle of a uh, hybrid LED uh, was uh, controlled by this process. I'm pretty sure HP patented that and uh, with Illinois, so we don't cross license each other on that. But this, uh, uh, temperature was like uh, 400 degrees C, and you can see a beautiful oxide form on top of that and cross the boundary of the phase diagram of the oxidation, uh, aluminum mass 9 and uh, gallium mass 9, uh, strain layer, and also uh, uh, oxidation process. And so this process was done in 1990. Obviously, uh, Nick Honig is pretty smart. He immediately realized that you need a patent that, so we fire a patent. And I think uh, every Vixel today required to pay you or buy the patent because of uh, the oxidation discovery. So I can tell you it's a, a, a joke of oxidation for reliability, but come out to be very useful uh, for that. And uh, obviously the first demonstration on that is 1993. That uh, 1993 was uh, demonstrate the edge emitting laser uh, to confine the, the, the uh, optical confinement and current confinement in the PN junction here and with a quantum well uh, inserted in here. So first edge emitting already demonstrated the concept of uh, uh, confinement, but both optical and current confinement uh, to a 2.5 micron aperture. Can and, you uh, point out where the oxide is on that? Yes, the oxide was oxidized from both sides in here. It's just one of those layers. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, uh, that allowed to uh, uh, define the optical aperture here. Yeah. And that's the most important part for making a smaller 
geometry. And, and the reason you need the, the, the semiconductor because you need the flow current injection. Like uh, most of us understand that current injection is a very important concept. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, Dennis Steffi was working at Bell Labs at that time. I went to visit Nick Honiak and saw that idea. And uh, he was working on the Vir uh, Vixo at uh, Bell Laboratory. And uh, obviously, he saw that idea and uh, immediately figured out how to use that in a Vixo a vertical cavity laser. And that uh, idea uh, generated uh, uh, the first use for a low threshold laser at uh, sub 1 milliamp, which become 0.23 milliamp. So in a, in a five year period, because it's oxidation breakthrough, integrated with a DBR and a quantum well, and results into a lower threshold a device of 0.23 milliamp. And that's the most important uh, breakthrough, I think, uh, uh, allow you to make uh, the device very reliable and uh, also open up uh, energy efficient, uh, energy per bits, high speed optical link today, because it consumes very low power. And uh, there's two reference here about the first initial 94, and there's a review paper. I'll talk about that technology on here. So, uh, uh, so today, what's uh, important about that oxide confine is the aperture, uh, really, uh, is you can confine this uh, aperture to define a very small cavity and result into a discrete mode and uh, allowable mode, which uh, into a so-called Purcell effect. And the Purcell effect basically saying is that when you have a field mode, your energy will excite into field mode, therefore you get lower threshold and also a fast recombination lifetime and results of that. And here's a demonstration with a different size of the, the Vixel, and you can see the mode, the threshold get reduced considerably, and uh, you can see the the cavity fundamental mode and that. And from this, you can actually calculate between the mode spectrum. Uh, here's a mode, fundamental mode and the first order mode, and 2112 mode. And therefore, between the two spacing, and you can calculate basically the optical dimension of the cavity here. And so the cavity today, uh, the, the good cavity today commercially is about seven micron uh, on that for 25 gigabits work. So uh, today's uh, device is, uh, is uh, as shown here. Uh, there's a bottom DBR here, and there's quite a bit of design on aluminum arsenide to get rid of heat, because semiconductor do need to require to get rid of heat in order to get the more efficient uh, recombination process. And you can see the oxidation here define the cavity uh, between this two point here. And additional oxidation here with a different aluminum garnet arsenide layer allow you to uh, allow the current only flow confined into uh, uh, the position here. And this uh, eliminated a lot of surface state problem at the site also. And that's a beautiful uh, work uh, being done and it turned out to be very useful. And so the reason uh, to, in order to make the device even better, and then you get into a so-called uh, half lambda design cavity. Half lambda is mean the uh, optical cavity here is only half lambda, it's a fundamental uh, smallest uh, geometry you can get. And in, inside of there, we inserted five quantum well, allowed to uh, provide the electron hole recombination to generate the photon on the system, okay? Provide the power into the system. So as you uh, see here, the device is very well built nowadays and operate in uh, 850 nanometer oxide confined vixel with uh, uh, up to, uh, aperture diameter about five micron. And uh, we can operate the device uh, from 25 degrees C all the way to 85 degrees C. And you can see the threshold don't move too much and very different than edge emitting laser where the, the temperature dependent shifting is on the gain of the operation. And this one is actually shifting by the cavity, so therefore it doesn't shift. And you can look at the spectrum here at uh, room temperature versus 85 degrees C and shifting is only uh, three, less than four nanometer. Uh, over the temperature range. And you can also see the power don't drop as much uh, as a normally uh, edge emitting device. So the device is a pretty well efficient use and uh, you can see T0 is always up to uh, 195 degrees C. So that's pretty well built a device and uh, uh, likely to be a next generation uh, 
uh, optical link of the system. So uh, to uh, pass a high-speed data rate, you require a bandwidth operation because the, the, the laser we're talking about today is a direct modulation laser. I mean, uh, we direct modulate the current, a microwave current. So you, if you do a current frequency response, you can see a resonant peak of the laser. And as uh, we push in, uh, the photon density increase by uh, injecting more current into the device, and you can see the bandwidth. Uh, increase it to about 29 gigahertz at room temperature. And you can see the data rate uh, is about 2x of the bandwidth. So it's approximately 57 gigabits and eye opening for error free uh, transmission all the way uh, to 57 gigabits, uh, 10 to the minus 12 arrow on that. Uh, the device not only had to sustain in a high speed, uh, high temperature operation but also had to be able to uh, run uh, this temperature range. Uh, you can see this is 85 degree C operation, and we plot in the error rate, uh, 10 to the minus 12 is our current standard, and uh, you can see uh, 50 gigabits operating at 85 degree C. That's a pretty, uh, uh, the, <coughs> the world record on the performance. Uh, number two, you also need to transmit uh, this uh, data, uh, multi-mode uh, signal into a multi-mode fiber, OM4, and uh, this are uh, looking at uh, 100 meter distance uh, for the data center application. And you can see uh, the, the data center basically can pass a 42 gigabits on the system like that. So uh, here we plot in some of the temperature versus uh, error rate. And, uh, and here is the room temperature operation. You can see most of the report. At a high temperature operation, these are the reported results over the distance as well. B2B stand uh, to three meter distance, which is short distance connection on that. In addition, uh, the VIX are also very useful for uh, generate, uh, 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 to increase the data rate, you can do either uh, do a PAM4, which is basically uh, increase uh, the data rate by doing the four level uh, amplitude uh, change. You can also do the phase change and here demonstrate the four by four uh, oxide vixel and cost 16 quam, and then you can increase the data over 100 gigabits uh, on that, except uh, the error rate is degraded quite a bit, so you need additional uh, electronics uh, error correction chip, which a silicon uh, company like it, because you, need, you got a business for them to do on that. So uh, what's the problem on uh, the today's vixel? And what's the future look like? Well, uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the dial laser is a current-driven device. So you modulate the, the microwave bandwidth uh, by modulating the current only. So therefore, uh, your limitation is obviously controlled by two processes. One is the delay time of electron hole recombination. I inject an electron into the system, electron hole, what's the time required to recombine? as I call tau B on that. And number two, uh, you look at the photon loss, right? Photon generation is by tau B, photon loss is by the, the laser output and also along the, the cavity line loss. So uh, let's uh, look forward, but uh, the tau B required time is approximately 200 uh, picosecond, which is about, and the, the photon loss time is about uh, three, four picoseconds, so it's like, uh, uh, almost 50 time difference. So we try to uh, look in at the reduction of the recombination lifetime and uh, because that control the bandwidth uh, uh, of this uh, rate equation uh, here and only basically controlled by two of the parameter here and then the photon density in the cavity of the system here. As you can see here, if we reduce our recombination lifetime from uh, one nanosecond down to two, picos, uh, two picosecond, you can see two things happen. One is the resonant peak disappear because the carrier injection are fast enough to get recombination. Therefore, you do not produce resonant peak like a dial laser did. And, uh, and uh, number two, the bandwidth also extended uh, all the way can be very quick into the system. So what is good about that is basically you uh, reduce so-called is a ringing effect on the digital signal. 
And therefore, uh, if you have a slow process, like a 250 uh, picosecond uh, recombination lifetime, your eye diagram got degraded badly. And if you have very clean 10 picosecond, you can see the eye diagram very clear on that system on that. So to improve that, that's how our future generation is to increase either photon density on the system by increased IO via threshold. Uh, that caused a power consumption problem. You got heat up the problem, right? And the other possible ability is reduce the recombination lifetime by current. And uh, there's other effect like Purcell effect of plasmonics, and that's also a problem. Basically, uh, Purcell effect, you have to make a device so small, therefore current density is so high, therefore you cannot really do a practical device on that. Plasmonic uh, is a surface effect, so not very efficient in the recombination process. So uh, uh, to increase that, uh, one of the group in uh, uh, Florida, basically, a uh, Dennis Davis group tried to increase the photon density in the system, and so tried to eliminate the oxide confinement by doing lithographic uh, define the area here and regrow uh, the dielectric material on top of that. And uh, according to that technique, you can see uh, you can increase the bandwidth uh, from uh, the 30 gigahertz to all the way to 50 gigahertz. So that's uh, look like an interesting technique, except you had to consume a lot more power on the system. The other possible uh, solution is looking at a different solution, which uh, I think uh, uh, to place electron hole recombination uh, into a transistor structure, right, a three terminal device. And uh, so we decide to do that. <coughs> so we identify basically the, the base recombination process can be both electrical and optical output by single transition or the recombination process. If we insert a quantum wall into the base, we improve the radiation, radiated recombination a lot. In this process, we do not choke the carrier. The slow carrier uh, basically flow out of the system, so we do not, we do not see the resonant peak. Uh, we do not see the resonant peak in the laser operation over the bandwidth. So this reduces uh, electron hole recombination time to a picosecond because controlled by the base. Uh, control is like a filter effect. And eliminate the charge uh, buildup uh, in, the, in the process here, so accumulation, like a laser, that's why it limit the speed operation. So this will speed up the direct modulation technique. So the first demonstration on that is to do LED, just tie the base collector and approve uh, you can have seven gigahertz bandwidth. And we do a microwave measurement to do a direct bandwidth. And one over two pi tau basically demonstrate uh, what the recombination lifetime is, is about 23 picosecond on that. That's a measurement data, not uh, calculated extrinsic data. So uh, uh, with uh, the confidence of a uh, uh, 23 picosecond base recombination lifetime, uh, the explanation to people is basically for dial laser, you pump the carry into a double head and quantum well, and you build up the carrier until the generation rate of the photon is, is high enough, and we call transparent carrier, about 1.5 10 to 10 to 18. And from that, you can uh, start lacing the device on that. Uh, for transistor laser, uh, you already have a base doping very high. So your injection carrier do not accumulate in the base and uh, get into a very fast recombination, no pile up effect. So we are talking about picosecond uh, controlling time on that. So uh, here's the first demonstration of the transistor laser in uh, 2005. And uh, you can see the light. You just take a camera, you can see the light <laughs> shining into the camera there. And uh, there's a transistor structure here. And uh, basically quantum well here. And this is the first time you can see the quantization effect occur at the ground state and first the excited state map out, uh, quantum, uh, map out the quantum transition. So you can see the electrically, up, electrically here output, and you can see the, the transistor operating as spontaneously into a stimulating, and then into a ground state, and into a first excited state. Optically, you can see the transition light uh, here, lambda zero and lambda one, and indicating the first and second rate. And also you can see the rate uh, in the, the first excited state is much faster than the rate on the ground state on the system here. 
The other discovery we have is uh, we discover there's an uh, intracavity photon system tunneling, or as I observe. And uh, basically, because the collector junction, as you apply voltage here, the collector junction allow you to begin to conduct in photon assistant tunneling uh, process, and uh, down to a certain point when you're switching from a coherent to incoherent rate, and then the, the, switch, the cavity begin to switch in, uh, sharp switching on this process. And number two, in this device, you don't see any resonant peak as a functional bias uh, on the device here. So both current driven and uh, voltage driven, and you can see the tunneling modulation on the system here. So uh, uh, photon system tunneling occur at the uh, collector junction of the device. So previously on diode, we're pretty much talking about current, current modulation by the BE junction here. And now we have additional collector junction can actually modulate this tunneling. So this, we believe this is a tunable tunneling uh, inside the cavity for direct modulation on that. And you can see the, the absorption here is about several times faster than uh, uh, just regular the, the photon system tunneling. It's uh, intracavity photon system tunneling, uh, much faster uh, modulation capability on the system. On that. And because of the, the tunneling uh, is a nonlinear process. And uh, so therefore, uh, to mix with uh, the current, you can have an internal mixer and a multiplier. So therefore, uh, we can actually show the multiplier uh, mi microwave mixing all the way up to a, tw a 10x on the system on that. And uh, the other discovery is uh, uh, you can also see the electrical and optical bite stability by a single operation of the voltage on the system here. And so this intracavity photon system tunneling is very exciting on the system here. So in conclusion, uh, we demonstrate here today that outside confined VIXO do impact the world and uh, low threshold and is widely used in the optical uh, high speed here and uh, up to 60 gigabits uh, consume approximately 9 picojoule per bit. Uh, today is about 20, uh, 20 to 21 picojoule per bit, the industry uh, standard on that. And uh, oxide confined VIXO are also going to find many application. Time of flight use on 3D camera on your cell phone, iPhone X, already using it. And uh, there's many uh, more going to come into uh, impact of future application as far as we know. Uh, transistor laser uh, provide a new physics because it provide a new uh, dimension of uh, tunneling modulation rather than current modulation on the system. We're expecting uh, speed will go up quite a bit and uh, hopefully reach to uh, 0.1 picojoule per bit. Three port of a transistor laser with multifunctionality uh, probably set the basis for the high speed electronic photonic integrated circuit. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that was uh, very interesting, and I'd like to uh, throw it open uh, for questions. Uh, there's no doubt that the uh, Vixels have uh, changed the world. Um, so uh, let me start off with the uh, first question. And that is, uh, you made a comment about uh, the oxidation. It's, it's kind of similar to the oxidation of silicon, where it's rather well known uh, that you get a very low surface recombination velocity. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever measured the surface recombination velocity uh, between uh, gallium arsenide and this type of aluminum oxide? Uh, I think it is the people made an MOS device based on this, and uh, I forget the number, but uh, okay. still high, I think. Okay, so it, that, that left some room for improvement. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, another quick question yes. uh, has to do with the competition between Vixels and silicon photonics. Yes. So it's uh, quite a stiff competition. And uh, what's your opinion about that? I think for a short distance, uh, Vixel direct modulation is going to be the most energy efficient at cost. And for 1.3 micron, no doubt it's silicon photonic going to win it all. Yeah. yeah. So there's, a both, there's room both for both. Going to, there's room yeah, for both. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, do we have any uh, other questions? Yeah. So, um, the Vixel market is taking off, right? Yes. I, I heard, we've talked to some epitaxy companies and we can't even get material out because it's so hot. Yes. What is the main driver that you see that causes this? I think uh, it's a uh, 3D imaging consume all the epi people can get because uh, the 
the, the application in that, and uh, it looked like all getting to a six inch wafer, Vixel. But in those cases, they don't need a lot of, uh, they need a power in single mode and the uh, array of the Vixel. Can you explain the 3D imaging? Uh, it, well, when you look at your face, you know, the face recognition on the 3D. So it's basically image. scanning, yes. scanning a laser. Mm -hmm. uh, Time of flight, two meter distance. You mean for security, so we don't have, yes. don't have to put in a password? Yes, that's more secure. That's very, very interesting. I, yeah. uh, but uh, I think I, if I you need can, a mask that looks like you, then I, <laughs> <laughs> I can get into your. Then nobody system. have the same ma uh, face yeah. <laughs> twice. Uh, you okay. can do a surgery. Okay. With that, uh, <laughs> let's thank Milton Feng again.